Hello, everybody. I'm Nicholas, and today we will have a debate uh, with uh, some of the uh, biggest names uh, in aging research in the world. Uh, we will we'll try to answer a, a question, a very important question about aging research, which is, is aging an active program in human development? So uh, to debate here, we have Josh Mitteldorf. Josh Mitteldorf has a PhD in physics uh, from the University of Pen uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, but uh, he is also a, a aging research, very known in, in the field. And we have here also uh, Michael Comboy. Uh, Michael Comboy uh, has his uh, PhD from uh, Stanford uh, University. He's a biologist. And Irina Comboy is also with us together with Michael. And uh, she has uh, her PhD also from uh, Stanford University uh, as a biologist. So um, we will start our debate. So, Michael, is aging an active program in human development? Great question. Um, I could see it be, being argued uh, from both both sides. So that's that's one of the reasons why I thought this was a this was a great opportunity to to uh, discuss this. So one of the things that's gonna that's gonna value be important here is uh, the semantics. What do we what do we mean by by uh, developmental program? When does development start? When does development end? It depends on who you who you talk to. But I, I would imagine as you get more towards the developmental biologists, they're going to argue that that development might start from from haploidy um, if you're a diploid, and so egg and sperm meet. There's fertilization. You've got a zygote that starts to develop into into an embryo that goes through some sort of some sort of um, growth and differentiation until you get a younger form um, that goes through some mature maturation phase until you get an, an adult form that's often reproductively uh, the reproductive time and then you get uh, another another diploid <clears throat> diploids uh, coming from that and the cycle repeats right for a billion years. Yes, there's a program for that, right? We, I think, the general consensus is that, you know, in our DNA, there's a code that that uh, that if everything is 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 orchestrated correctly, um, on top of existing uh, templates that are usually provided by the previous generation, uh, you can get you can get that to process to happen. You can go from from two two haploids meeting to an adult that's gonna that's gonna produce more more progeny, and the signals that are along the way there um, govern, well, I say it is govern how cells develop from the same type of cell to different cells that give you skin, uh, muscle and bone on the inside, uh, and then gut on the very on the very inside, right? For example, so so the question then is: Is that the program that that causes us to age? Or is there another program on top of that that is activated, let's say, either preferentially or uniquely later in life, um, let's say at or after the reproductive phase, that causes us to, to grow old, right? Uh, geric, let's say, so geriatric. Um, and that eventually, that eventually kills us. So I think, I think that's where, in my mind, that's where the knife goes, goes through, where there's there's good debate on either on either side of that. I, I would argue that that in humans we don't need to invoke an additional program. If there's if if you want to argue that there's programmed aging, then it would have to be some sort of trajectory off of the developmental programs that got us to adulthood and reproductive age to, to begin with. Okay, uh, Josh. Uh... What do you think about um, Michael's answer and what is your answer? I guess my first thing is I'm the only person in the world who's written two books on this subject and dozens of articles. I'm the last person to be presenting a one hour summary. I'm likely to get too far into the weeds. And when I do that, I just ask you to stop me. It's inevitable that I'm going to get into the weeds. So let me just start with the obvious. 
everything in biology is the result of evolution. We agree on that. And for any general feature of biological organisms, the default explanation should be that evolution arranged it that way. And the more so for a feature like aging, which is ubiquitous through the biosphere and which has a genetic basis that can be traced back all the way a billion years to the first protists. Yeah, some of the same genes that regulate aging in single celled organisms like yeast are active in every mammal, including us today. There must be a reason that natural selection has kept these genes through a billion years of evolutionary diversification. So when George Williams scratched his head and said, what's going on here? He said, well, the body creates itself from a single gamete, and then it's not able to repair itself after the hard work is done. The quote is, it is indeed remarkable that after a seemingly miraculous feat of morphogenesis, a complex metazoan should be unable to perform the much simpler task of merely maintaining what's already formed. And from that, you say, of course, the body could repair itself if it wanted to. And the question is, why doesn't it? There are only four games in town. And I'm just going to outline all four and the reasons I uh, prefer one of them. The four games. One is that aging is just wearing out. It's physical. Nothing to do with um, evolution. Everything to do with entropy. I call that option zero. Option one. Aging genes are not weeded out because the natural selection doesn't see them. They affect fitness only late in life. Two, the aging genes are pleiotropic, which means that what causes you to age can't be separated from the detriments of aging. It's the same genes. Three, aging comes from a need to budget food resources. Um, So the body compromises, short changes, repair and maintenance in favor of reproduction. And four, the last aging is an adaptation. It's advantageous for the community, even though it's detrimental for the individual. And that's what I'm arguing today. And just briefly to, to outline why I don't believe in the first three. Uh, zero is uh, entropy. Um, the second law of thermodynamics says that in a closed system, the second law of entropy must always increase in a closed system. But of course, bodies are open systems. We take in energy from the environment. We dump our entropy out into the environment. So the second law doesn't apply. And even if you didn't believe that, there are some animals and plants that don't age. So clearly, it's not a physical requirement. The second um, what I called number one is called mutation accumulation, that natural selection just hasn't had time to weed out these genes because they are, show their effect only late in life and they're not very important. Well, Owen Jones, um, in a paper called Diversity of Aging Across the Tree of Life in 2014, just shattered this by showing that there's a strong effect of aging on reproductive fitness as it's usually defined. And besides, as I said, aging genes are recent, or or not recent. I mean, in the mutation accumulation theory, you would expect that the aging genes, well, they just got here uh, in the last few million years. They just, evolution hasn't had time to weed them out yet. But as I said, aging genes are ancient. And they've been preserved for billion years, not for millions. Um, the most common theory today is called antagonistic pleiotropy. And it means that um, the same genes that cause us to age also have benefits for reproductive fitness. And the body can't get rid of the aging genes without also getting rid of the its own reproduction. So the the foremost advocate of this was Michael Rose, and he designed an experiment that he ran for decades where he bred animals for longevity. You know, that, So if you've got the longevity genes, they should gradually be losing their fertility. And what he found instead was that, damn it, those fruit flies that he was breeding, not only did they live four times longer than the original fruit flies he started with, but every day of their life, 
they laid more eggs than the wild type. So clearly, uh, at least in that one case, um, the genes that cause aging are not the same as the genes that promote fertility. So the, the next theory is called the disposable soma theory of Tom Kirkwood. And that says that we age because we don't have enough caloric energy to both reproduct, reproduce optimally in the present and to keep our bodies in good repair for the long term. And I don't know what he was thinking. He didn't know about caloric restriction when he came up with this theory. But years later, he did know about it. You know, how can you argue that if you think that it's caloric, an insufficiency of caloric energy that makes you age, then why the hell would caloric restriction be the most powerful way to extend lifespan? The theory clearly predicts that the more you eat, the longer you live. And we just know that isn't true. So to me, the disposable soma theory is dead in the water. And really, what that leaves is the group selection theory. And people argue against it on theoretical grounds. They say, well, there's no such thing as group selection. Aging is so bad for the individual. How could it possibly evolve? There's no benefit to the group that could be that strong. And that's really how I've spent my career is it's, it's a very legitimate question. And I've come up with evolutionary models that extend evolution into ecology. And when you understand evolution in the context of ecology, it's not so surprising that aging is an adaptation. Okay, so Michael, uh, do you think uh, it makes sense what, what uh, Josh just said? I mean, some I agree with, I think, and and what I understand, I can, I can decide whether I agree, agree with it or not if I... But I just, if I just don't get it, I'm going to be honest and say, look, I just don't get it. So, um, but some some points I think are kind of interesting, right? So, um, the, the aging effect on 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 reproductive fitness, right? So, in in humans, in in animals that are kind of related to humans, I guess you know mammals and things like that. Yeah, I think that's definitely you know birds probably that that seems to be def generally the case. Um, in animals that that appear to be less mortal, right? So I don't know if they're immortal, but like there's some re reptiles and, and, and fish and things and, that, that will, um, not, not salmon, we're gonna we'll leave, leave those aside, but other, other fish, they, the, the big fish in the small pond kind of evolutionary theory seems to, seems to be sort of valid for that, where they, they, can, they can get bigger and bigger and grow from a reproductive, the start of reproductive uh, activity to something that's that's ten times that size, right? Or maybe you know, and, and you know, and many many years uh, into the future. Clams are your best example. Perfect clams, right? They don't seem to have a decline in reproductive uh, fitness um, when they do genetic studies of you know the you know the DNA of all the the fish they pull out in, in the net, they find weird things for some of these fish where like, you know, 90% of the, of the fish all seem to be derived from like one individual. Right. And so there's some, you know, big cod fish or something swimming off the East coast that is giving birth to, you know, or some closely related group that's, that's super huge. That's giving, giving birth to all these, all these, uh, all these egg, eggs and the hatch into, into all these fish. So, so in cases like that, um, so it doesn't it doesn't have to be linked um, in 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 humans. Yeah, it's probably linked. And so I think one of the, the the opportunities I think in in study and science is to try to figure out why is this right? There, there's there's definitely some relationship between uh, having the ability to contribute to to uh, to future generations and that being selected for. And in some animals, that means being able to just physically being able to reproduce. In general, they seem to be able to continue to grow. Um, whereas mammals, we, we can't do that. Birds, we can't do that. We get to a certain adult size and that's it. Um, and I can make the, I'd be happy to make a, some discussion later on about some of the molecular reasons why, why when we're growing, we don't seem to age and why when we stop growing. In, in my mind, there seems to be some good molecular reasons why that's when the signs of aging start to appear um but maybe that's a that's a that might be the you know another round or something like that 
Um, and the idea of group selection, I, I agree with group, you know, the group selection to, to a point. I, I, I could I could say that, well, that to me, that seems to be a good reason why humans, one of the reasons why humans seem to live longer than our, our closest relatives, uh, the great apes. There's probably some developmental and molecular reasons and genetic reasons why why we ended up living longer. We seem to have a, a slower development to begin with. Maybe that extends into a longer life. But why that is continued to be selected for the group selection, the the, the value to the to a to a social group of having some elder people that have seen it all before um, is is extremely valuable. And, and maybe there were bottlenecks in human history where that was that was the key thing that that kept our ancestors alive. Um, again, it's just, uh, uh, that's not my kind of biology. I'm not an evolutionary biologist, really. I'm not even, you know, I'm not into, I don't know more about that than anybody else, but um, that seemed to fit. Um, you had a comment? Yeah, okay. I'm like yeah. Behind, behind the scenes, I have a reality <laughs> check comment. So um, evolution only was operation operational for maybe what, one billion years? Let's give it, give it take, right? Second law of thermodynamics or entropy was in place for many, many more billions of years. And it is quite powerful saying that organized systems are going to fall apart, which we detect as aging or increased risks, risk of disease. So the question is, was there enough time to offset and to develop and evolve all of these mechanisms to repair every single thing in our bodies, starting from the body itself, the organ system, tissues, cells, little molecules inside the cells, so that we will stand the entropy longer than we do it now. Entropy is the thing that makes us grow old and fall apart and dysregulated. And evolution perhaps was working and doing its best but it's super difficult. It's not just one thing that needs to be changed. It's myriads of things that need to evolve to prevent entropy effects on the organized system, such as a person or a mouse or a cow. And then there is no evolutionary pressure to do it better than any other organized system. Yes, an idealized organism that lives 50,000 years and propagates can you know, populate the planet. But it doesn't have to do that as long as other organized systems around it are not fit very quickly. So or, or how about if it, as long as its progeny can... Or as long as yeah, its progeny yeah. can outcompete other progeny within a few months or a few days or a few years. Mm -hmm. So there's absolutely no, no pressure to create an idealized, ever-repaired, functional biological system. And furthermore, there is not enough time. One billion years for us seems like a lot of time to repair everything, but from a universal perspective, you know, to paraphrase the quote on a long enough timeline, everybody's survivability becomes zero, and that is the reality check. Okay, Irina, Michael, thanks. Uh, Josh, uh, what do you think? Uh, what is your answer? Well, let's start with um, Michael's examples of animals that don't age. Yeah, I don't know why that is. It's it's complicated why every species has the lifespan it does and why some have an indefinite lifespan. Clams, um, sharks, lobsters seem to keep growing forever, getting more and more fertile, less likely to die with every passing year. You know, that's the opposite of humans, get more likely to die with every passive year passing year. And I don't know why that is, but it's certainly a counterexample to what Irena is saying, that it's all about entropy, um, that em entropy accumulates and gee, a billion years might not be enough time. Well, you know, these animals, sharks are, <laughs> are very old and they figured out how not to, clams are much, much older and they figured out how not to age at all. You know, I, I must say I'm not when I was preparing for this, I just imagined that the entropy theory was dead in the water, as most biologists agree. Um, but we can discuss that one if if you want. Uh, I'm happy not to discuss the entropy theory. I mean, we can agree that there's entropy. <laughs> um, I think on um, I, I, I'm happy to focus in on um, maybe on the on the tens of years and of, of lifespan increase. You know. 100-year lifespans 
right? In, the, in those range, I don't need to go out to a billion just yet. And even even things like that are supposedly indefinite, have indefinite lifespans. Yeah, they they get signs of 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 their life. You'll there'll be unrepaired scars on the skin of the shark. There'll be dents in the in the shell of the clam. There'll be lobsters that. Yeah, they can maybe grow a grow a claw back, but does it look exactly the same as the previous claw? I don't know, right? You know, so um, is that entropy? Is that is that <laughs> is that response to to the the insults of, the, of life? But maybe it's a, for for a subject for a different discussion later, or maybe at a, a, a later round would be to come back to entropy. But I think there's there's plenty right right here and some of the other stuff. Good. I'm, I'm happy to <laughs> happy to move on. Now I want to respond to something that you said earlier, that in humans, there seems to be evidence of a link between reproductive success and longevity. And the experimental evidence for that surprisingly is in the opposite direction of what's predicted. The more babies a woman has, the longer they live. There have been about a dozen studies of uh, survey studies or correlating how many babies a woman has with how long she lives. And all of them have shown either no effect at all or a slight positive co correlation. The longer, oh, the more babies a woman has, the longer she lives. Now, Mike Kirkwood, as I said, is stuck on this theory, which really absolutely predicts that having babies costs energy and it must take away from your lifespan. So in 1998, very famously, uh, Westendorp and Kirkwood published an article featured in Nature and uh, reviewed on the front page of the New York Times called Human Longevity at the Cost of Reproductive Success where they analyzed a database of 3,000 Brits going back 800 years and looked at how many children they had and how long they lived. And the summary of that article was, we found evidence that having babies shortens lifespan. And if so, it would be a real outlier among all the other survey studies that were done. So at the time, 1998, I was already deep into this stuff. I downloaded their database of 3,000 individuals and did my own analysis. What I found is that instead of just drawing a straight line through the data, they used something called a Poisson regression. I'd never heard of a Poisson regression in 1998. I had to look it up. A Poisson regression assumes that the number of babies that a woman has is Poisson distributed. And you don't have to know too much about what that means, except that it falls off very, very steeply for more than about seven or eight babies. There's zero probability that a woman's going to have 14 or 15 babies. And yet in their database, there were a handful. There were five women who had more than 15 babies. And I found that if you would eliminate those five women out of 3,000, even their Poisson regression shows that the more women, the more babies you have, the longer a woman lives. And of course, if you do the, the first thing I did was just draw a straight line through it. Uh, a linear regression is the obvious test to use. You use a linear regression and you find very robustly that the more babies a woman had, the longer she lived in agreement with all those other studies. And this, despite the fact that this database goes back 800 years, and uh, for the first uh, six of those 800 years, lifespans were a whole lot shorter, and the number of children that a woman had were much, much greater. So time is working against us in that, you know, just the time alone would be expected to produce a, pos a negative correlation between, in the raw data, between number of children a woman had and her lifespan, just because the women who had a lot of children were in the older part of the database and the women who lived shorter were in the older part of the database. But even despite that, you draw a straight line through it and you get the more babies a woman has, the longer she lives. So um, you are uh, obviously uh, you have some uh, 
differences about uh, you know the 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 the, the role of um, entropy or and other issues. But uh, I know that uh, uh, you are uh, often cited uh, together when uh, we are talking about uh, the nature of aging in the sense uh, if aging is an a uh, phenomenon decided in the in the systemic level or the cell level. So there are scientists in the aging field that argue that aging accumulation of damage in the in the cells and the tissues at, uh, at the uh, tissue level, and uh, there are scientists that say that aging is uh, a process uh, decided, let's say, at, at the systemic level at and uh, many people uh, cite you in, in different camps, saying that sometimes Josh uh, defends that uh, it's there are pro youth uh, um, factors in the blood. Or some people say that uh, the, the convoys, in the plural, uh, defend that there are uh, pro aging uh, factors. And uh, but we are talking uh, of the systemic level uh, of control of aging. So uh, in that sense, I would like to ask you both, and of course, Irina, um, uh, how you are in relation with that question. I mean, is aging uh, uh, a systemic process or is the fundamental uh Beginning is is the cell and tissue level. What do you think, Michael and and Irina? Um, I mean, it's it affects it's both, right? So, so that I guess there's a a concept to bring up is is um one one that we tend to look through a lens of of um so I guess stem cell biology was big in the you know the two thousands, right? So, um, you've got your your stem cell, and it could be an early on um, embryonic stem cell. It could be later, a you know, a lineage restricted stem cell. It could be adult tissue stem cell. But things that are in common to these to these uh, stem cells is they they will divide slowly, and it appears that while they're taking their time, sweet time to divide, they're doing a good job of of repairing DNA. Right. So you'll see a lot of a lot of activity. In such cells, uh, maintaining DNA integrity, checking uh, base mismatches, things like that, Rep uh, extending, repairing, and extending telomeric ends um, of chromosomes, right, chromatid ends. Those cells can divide to make more stem cells, and when you're growing, they do that. They get signals, um, often systemic signals. At an early age, it's signals that the stem cells produce to neighboring stem cells, right? That say we're all in a growth, in, in coordinated growth. Um, let's divide and make more of ourselves, right? At some point, those cells can also divide asymmetrically to give one renewing stem cell, and that's the d definition of a stem cell that it, it self renews, and a, and a, and a, a second daughter cell that uh, will have some sort of uh, uh, increased differentiation. Yeah, so stem cells they can they amplify their population. They can also divide asymmetrically to give a renewing stem cell, which is the definition of a stem cell. And a more differentiated cell, which is often considered a progenitor cell, because it'll be differentiated along some particular lineage. You know, it might be um, in early embryogenesis, it's the outside of the embryo versus the inside of the embryo versus a middle layer that's developing. Later on, it might be neural restricted, or it might be epithelium restricted, or it might be muscle or, or bone or gut or something like that, right? So anyway, the progenitor cells, they can also divide. They usually can divide a lot faster. And they don't seem to do a particularly good job of maintaining DNA integrity. Um, they don't ha have telomerase activity. They don't maintain their telomeric ends. Maybe they don't need to because they're going to divide, but they're not going to divide indefinitely. They're going to divide um, to get a certain mass of cells that, can, that then all of those cells are destined to either differentiate into the final tissue or get signaled that they're not needed and then they'll die. So the progenitor cell... Uh, has the capacity to divide much faster than the stem cell, but it doesn't do a good job of maintaining its DNA integrity. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't maintain telomeric ends. It doesn't have telomerase activity. 
And then all those progenitor cells, uh, when they get to a certain cell number or certain signal, they'll differentiate into uh, the, the final differentiated tissue. And extra, extra progenitor cells you typically are, you know, they die either by apoptosis or some sort of necrosis or whatever, giving us space between the fingers, um, you know, t tissue that's not needed uh, to form the uh, cells that are not needed to form the, the final tissue. And the final differentiated tissue doesn't have, um, doesn't need uh, DNA repair or telomerase because it's not dividing, right? So, all right. So, so what does it have to do with aging? <laughs> okay, <laughs> right. So, so when we see um, cellular aging in an organism, right? So this is this is different than cells grown in culture that they divide and divide and divide and they they get to um, after whatever the Hayflick number, right? Um, the cells they they arrest and they and they they don't divide anymore and they call those cells senescent, right? So yes, there's a process that goes on in the tissue culture dish in the lab called cellular senescence. It doesn't necessarily have to occur or occur in the same way in in an organism because an organism can be a little different than than what's what's going on in the lab. Okay, but but there are definitely cells in an old an old organism, and the question is is are these cells senescent, right? So, and I think that's a that's a that's a big question that's still sort of out there and not really not really answered. Um, there there are experiments that 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 uh, where they they add senolytics, right? So they administer some sort of drug or compound that's going to or some, have some genetic system that's going to kill cells that they think have uh, the characteristics of these senescent cells that they've they're they're not just necessarily differentiated cells. They might be a progenitor cell. They might be a stem cell or whatever. But they, they, they've they've gotten to a point where they've gotten stuck in their in their cell cycle, and they're not they're not dividing well. They've, they've, there's some error. There's some mistake. I think it's a it's 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 not if it's those cells. It's not that they don't have long enough telomeric ends. It's, usually, it's typically something else. It's typically some other. Um, DNA, unrepaired DNA damage. They picked up um, uh, cross-linked DNA, or so, there's something something that's 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 stopping them from from dividing, right? So, are, how many of those cells are there, right? Um, there's evidence that there's not a whole lot of them, right? Or I haven't seen a, a lot of evidence that there's a lot of them yet. If you do something to to try to tackle those cells and kill those cells, you seem to get a a, 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 a you know, ten years ago, when they were when they were doing these experiments in in some weird genetic strain of mouse, like these bub R one progeric mice, I would say, well, I don't know, it might be kind of unique to those those cells. But over the past decade or so, there's been data that comes in that that says, yeah, even in normal mice, you, if you get rid of these cells, um, the mice seem to be a little healthier. You you can compress morbidity, maybe even extend lifespan a little bit. So I can come back to the I've talked a while, so I can come back to the systemic <laughs> effects of aging, but that's sort of my take on the on the cellular part of aging. That there's there's definitely things that go on with with cells um, as we age, but I see it through the lens of stem cell, progenitor cell, differentiated cell. And one thing to keep in mind is that when you're growing, you've got a lot of stem cells dividing, making more stem cells. That when they produce progenitor cells, those progenitor cells don't have to divide too much to get the ultimate the the, the final tissue. When you get older, the signals are, are to keep the stem cells from dividing, right? The, they, there tends to be sort of a balance between differentiate, differentiate, or grow, grow. When you get older, it's differentiate, differentiate, differentiate. And the stem cells perceive that as like, well, we're not really needed, we're not growing. So they don't divide as much. And then I see the burden of, of, of to provide cells for a given tissue, turnover, repair, whatever, then it falls on the progenitors, and the progenitors don't have telomerase activity. They don't have good DNA repair. So when you look at the tissue as a whole, in the end, you say, "Oh, the DNA repair wasn't so good in that tissue, or the telomeres got shorter." And is it is it a result of whatever else you're thinking, or is it a result that no, no, literally the cells that made that tissue didn't have the capacity. Most of them didn't have capacity to maintain their DNA or or or, re, or repair or maintain their telomeric ends, right? Not the way they did when most of the cells 
that were contributing to that tissue were more STEMI and had that had that ability. So okay, um, so Josh, uh, what do you think uh, regarding what uh, Michael said uh, regarding the the cell uh, part of the process, but also uh, linked to the systemic uh, signaling? Uh, on the questions of biochemistry, I'm happy to defer to Mike and Arena. They're the most knowledgeable people I know in this area, and it's not my background. I, I knew this in general, but I'm I'm learning from what Mike says, uh, that the progenitor cells also have a capacity to divide and produce more progenitor cells, and it's those cells that don't... Um, don't have telomerase, don't do as good a job of repairing their DNA. And I would ask, why not? You know, because I'm a big picture person. Why don't they have telomerase? Telomerase is free. It's, uh, the genes for telomerase are in every cell. Turning it on has very little uh, negligible metabolic cost. Uh, Extending telomeres is essentially a free process, and it's not turned on. Uh, the same is, is true with DNA repair. We know that it's easy from Pito's paradox. I don't know if you've heard of Pito's paradox, but the idea is um, mice live for two years, they get cancer, and that's what kills them. So if you extrapolate, you know, they, they get mutations in their cells that kill them. Whales live 100 times longer than mice, and they have about a million times as many cells as mice. So you'd think they're going to get cancer 100 million times faster. And yet, whales never get cancer. That's what's referred to as Pito's paradox. And what that says to me is that DNA repair, the body decides how much DNA repair to do. It's not something that's beyond the reach of evolution. If you need to repair your DNA, you re repair it. And studies have shown that damaged DNA is a factor in old people. I mean, you can see that old people have more damaged DNA than younger people, but you can also see that their longevity is not limited by their uh, DNA repair. In fact, there is no correlation between how, how many errors there are in the DNA and the life expectancy of a person. So uh, that's, that's an interesting thing to note. I, I want to get back to the story of telomeres. I, I think this is a big clue about uh, sorry, uh, can, sorry, can, sorry, George. Can Erin interject for yeah, that? Uh, yes. um, yeah. that comes with, uh, <laughs> yeah, I can be. I, yeah. I'm happily behind the scenes. So, uh, so George, there are all uh, already um, there are already answers to all of your conundrums, and there are no theoretical biology answers. There are experimental biomedicine answers. So, uh, so first thing first, there is no positive correlation between having 15 children and living longer or living shorter. There is correlation, by the way, is not causality. There is perfect correlation between having 15 children at the same time when sanitation was worse, living conditions were worse for women okay. and for people in general, and there were no antibiotics, and then living in a more civilized, better medicine-equipped world. So, um, you mentioned something like that, but right. let's move on. From so that, um, right? yeah. so, so yeah. that is, that is yeah. the first thing. Mm -hmm. We cannot really build correlation-based ideas where causality could lay. Well, but uh, just to to clarify that, what, what I said was that, that that works, that would produce a, net, a natural negative correlation between the number of children you have and your lifespan. And despite that, in Westendorp's own database, I found a positive correlation. Okay, good. So, so the correlation is between women having to have many children because they didn't have a choice not to have many children, and also all other things around them that contributed to longevity were much worse off than they are now when we have less children. But uh, but that is just one in, you know example of building theories on correlations rather than causalities because correlations are not causalities. The second point is much easier to, to explain. Why is that progenitor cells do not have telomerase activity? It has nothing to do with energy constraints. I actually teach it in my class. Most of the time, it's one of the questions on the exam. 
So progenitors cells are transiently amplifying the divide the load and quickly to repair the wound. And we don't have a luxury of them dividing slow enough to have checks on the DNA damage, cell cycle progression, or actually have telomerase mechanisms that are just lengthy. And so the, what then evolved is that they don't have telomerase activity on purpose, because if they did, then we would develop cancers much more frequently and would die very early in life. And then because they don't have telomerase activity, even if they lose their cell cycle progression checkpoints and start dividing uncontrollably without telomerase activity, telomeres are shortened, then genome becomes in disarray, disbalanced, there is rampant genomic instability, and that is our one of the protections against cancers. So that actually is the bottleneck. Progenitor cells on purpose evolved not to have telomerase activity because that protects us against their uncontrollable division and cancer development. Stem cells, on the other hand, have telomerase activity because it comes with the burden of very slow progressions through cell cycle. So stem cells check their fidelity of DNA for about two to three days, and only if fidelity is high, they go through cell cycle. So we can afford them telomerase activity. But we would grow too slow if we relied on just stem cells. And it, yes. And we wouldn't be able to repair our, our exactly. wounds. Or it would apply to infections. Before, before we, as, as warm-blooded animals, before we starve to death. Before we starve um, to death. So, an interesting experiment would be to look at, at, at reptiles and amphibia when they, you know, what's their stem to progenitor cell population? What's the, and this might even be known, I, I, mm -hmm. I could probably look it up. Do they do they have more stem cells in that blastema as they're as they're regenerating a limb? Um, my 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 general understanding is yeah they probably do because a lot of those cells appear to be kind of undifferentiated stem. Um, yes, they don't they don't have the metabolic demand that 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 says you look you get if you, if you don't get food in, in a couple of days you're going to starve to death. They can sit there at whatever temperature they're at and slowly divide and slowly divide and and yeah. and that's been proposed as one of the reasons why they can regenerate tails and limbs and things like that and and um, and then we lost that capacity. Yeah, and um, you know most warm-blooded animals can't do that. So uh, regarding that uh, that part of 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 the explanation, I mean, of aging, uh, Josh, do you think this fits with the systemic uh, level um, aging controlled by a systemic level, do you think? So what Irena raises is exactly the standard theory. Why isn't telomerase expressed more? Uh, it's because the animal gets cancer and the expression of telomerase is evolved as a compromise between cutting off life uh, cutting lifespan short because you run out of replicative ability and protecting against cancer. And that, that's not what she said. She, she, she yeah, said no, she primarily that it takes too long to extend telomeres and repair DNA. Yeah. So, so that's a variant on the standard theory that it's, it's about cancer. Um, I, I, Ready, to, ready to see that. I don't know how much energy it takes, or I don't know how long it takes to uh, express telomerase and extend the telomeres if you're generating a new cell. Whether that contributes substantially to the time that it takes to create a new cell, I, I really don't know that. And you guys do, so I'm happy to listen. I do note that Blasco did experiments 15 years ago in which she added extra telomerase genes to mice. Now, mice usually die of cancer. So you'd expect that if their telomerase expression is optimized, you would expect that if you add extra telomerase genes in, then the animals would both get more cancer and they'd live shorter as a result. And what Blasco found, to the surprise of herself as much as anybody else, was that these animals actually lived longer with extra telomerase, and they didn't seem to get appreciably more cancer, which I, I don't understand in, in theory, but I, I think it's, it's an interesting point, and it says that expression of telomerase is not cut off 
as a cancer pre preventive. I, I'd also go back, that there's a story I love to tell about, or, or where does this come from? The economizing on telomerase. Why don't we just freely express telomerase? It goes all the way back to ciliates. Again, almost a billion years ago, ciliates are one-celled animals. Clearly, cancer is not at all relevant to their lifestyle. Um, and yet, when a ciliate divides, telomerase is not expressed. So the cell gets sh uh, the telomeres get shorter and shorter with each cell division until the ciliate uh, pairs up with another ciliate and has sex. They share genes in a process that's called conjugation, analogous to mammalian sex. And when they share their genes, that's when telomerase is expressed. And it seems to me that that story shows that the um, cutting telomerase off as a way of inducing cell senescence is an ancient, ancient adaptation. It goes way back, and its first, uh, first application was in ciliates, creating a primitive form of aging in ciliates, forcing them to share their genes, forcing them to undergo conjugation um, at the at the cost of not being able to keep on reproducing if they don't do that. I, I also wanted to, to respond to what what Irina said about regeneration, that for some reason we don't have, mammals don't have the ability to regenerate that some of the, um, some of our forebears have. Um, it's an interesting experiment that Ellen Heber Katz did maybe 10 or 15 years ago with a strain of mice that um, regenerate much better. They can regrow heart cells, which other mammals can't do. If you lacerate their skin, it always grows back without a scar. What, what is it about these mice? Uh, you know, they must have some gen extra genetic information. And Heber Katz looked into that and she found, damn it, it wasn't some extra genetic inflammation information. It was a defect in a cell. There was in a, in a gene, there was actually a gene that actively turns off regeneration in mice. And if you disable that gene, then the mice are able to regenerate. So I would say that that, exam, that gene is an example of an active aging adaptation. I, there's a lot of things that I, I, I could comment and correct on this. So if you want to hear it. Yeah, of course, Michael, we, we can see we can see that uh, you are uh, you have some important differences. This, this conversation is not enough to uh, to explain all these big differences. So we can see that some uh, very deep concepts of you are very different and some of of other concepts not. But uh i think it's important for our uh viewers to to understand that science real science is not something that can be uh solved in in one conversation and uh obviously uh this could take hours of of conversation and i will i would like to to ask you to uh, our time is uh is is if it's finishing like w w what we uh we're thinking about one hour of, of conversation. So I would like to, to ask you um, to, to make your final considerations of, of this debate and taking into account uh, what uh, the, the regular viewer is thinking, because, you know, obviously you have some difference about scientific conceptions, but what the aging uh, science is looking for uh, is improving uh, the life uh, from the point of view of extending life and extending view, youth and maybe rejuvenation, reju rejuvenate people. So the viewers want to uh, this kind of uh, uh, result. So what can you say to, to people about the uh, what do you expect for the next years uh, about aging and rejuvenation, uh, rejuvenation research? What do you expect? For the next years, uh, Michael uh, and Irina, please. Well, one thing that happens in science is, and that's going to happen in the next years, is, is, is I hope, 
We keep revisiting ideas and facts that we assume to be correct and ask, are they really correct? Um, there's a lot of information out there that, um, that maybe even at one time I thought was correct if I knew it. Um, and, uh, and now I, I realize may not be correct because while sometimes you can find evidence to support a hypothesis, um, in science, you get trained to learn to spot evidence that disproves the hypothesis, right? And then, then you start saying, okay, well, what, what is with the hypothesis that's, that's inconsistent with the new data, right? And you might have to change the hypothesis. You might have to relook at the data and fi figure out what's going on, right? So, and that can, that can help um, as you, as you go iteratively over the same idea over and over again, you start to get more and more specific and, and, and hopefully a little bit better understanding, right? So, so there's a, there's a couple things that, that, um, that I, I think are, are, are misunderstood, right? So I haven't seen mice and we work with mice. I haven't seen a lot of, a lot of old mice dying from cancer. Um, I, I know the strain of mice that we typically use in a lab um, was was had some either either utility was either bred for or or generally got cancer so it was good for using let's say like radiation exposure studies and things like that but we have old mice and the and they typically die from from uh, some sort of infection persistent infection they might die from some sort of metabolic thing like they're just they're 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 kind of wasting away they're not they're not digesting well they get some either impaction or blockage or right they um well, I don't know if they die from the osteoporosis, but they, they get osteoporosis, they right? They certainly have it. Um, or, they have you know, heart problems. They heart problems, right? So they, they'll get cardiac failure, right? Mm -hmm. We do the dissections. We don't see, you know, there's not like some huge tumor or something like that that's, that's you know, that's occasionally we do see that. But but certainly that, I wouldn't say that categorically mice die from cancer, right? They, they Mice die from apparently what a lot of old people die from, right? Um. The MR, the MRL mice that you talked about, that strain of mice that that uh, that had the mutation, the mutation was in is in a gene that um, degrades another protein that is involved in in uh, in, in a lot of stem cells participation, activation, and participation in in, uh, in tissue maintenance and repair. So specifically tissue repair, right? So it's the hypoxia inducible factor. So if you if you have a mutation in one of the genes whose protein degrades hypoxia inducible factor, now you have more hypoxia inducible factor. And in that strain of mice then, even though they have a mutation, basically it gave them a, more of a gain of function of that, of that, of that protein. And that's why um, those cells were more active and they would, re, they would repair their, their, you know, hole punches in ears and their, in their, in their toes and, you know, skin uh, defects and that kind of stuff, heart, whatever, right? Uh, probably a, a good argument, a good discussion for another day would be, well, does that, would that have been selected for in the wild, right? <laughs> um, and then there's other, this, this, the, this Blasco paper, right, about um, adding telomerase to, which, which if you read the title in the, in the abstract, sounds like it's, they added telomerase to, to mice and the mice lived longer. But if you go in and you go and you read the details, and that's a fairly recent paper. So it may be that with time and, and, more examination, we'll have a better understanding of what's going on there. But at a deep read of that paper, uh, it looks like it's it's kind of an experimental setup. They didn't do the simple experiment, the nice clean experiment, which would be you have a strain of mice and you add telomerase gene to it, maybe an inducible telomerase gene, and you then <laughs> turn on the telomerase in one mice and, and don't have the telomerase on the other mice, and then see, well, who lives longer, right? No, they did something kind of strange. They have embryonic stem cells that are growing in culture, mouse embryonic stem cells. And they look as they, as they isolate the embryonic stem cells from a mouse embryo and then start to culture them, what they see is they see an increase in telomeres and telomerase activity in those cells. And that plateaus at like, I don't know, 20 passages or something like that. And so what they did is they, they implanted embryonic stem, they injected embryonic stem cells from early cultures and, you know, the middle cultures where they had longer telomeres into mouse blastulas and planted those blastulas and then asked, okay, those progeny that grow, who lives, who lives longer? And there, there's, 
I don't know where to where to begin about the you know the 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 the, the things that <laughs> the the unknowns uh, uncontrolled <laughs> variables that are thrown into the into the experiment by doing it that way, except that that's awfully complicated to answer that question, <laughs> right? So so I don't know what to make of that paper. You know, there's it may simply be that the embryonic stem cells after that many patches are just better embryonic, they're just healthier in general. And we know a lot of progeric uh, models in, in, in mice and, and when we see progeria in people, those are often caused by some, some level of DNA, loss of DNA repair, loss of DNA integrity, loss of gene proper gene expression off the DNA that, that that's there. That's, that's, a, that's like a, a guarantee to have, to have progeria. So, and conversely, a little bit better DNA fixing and repair can give you potentially a longer, uh, potential longer life. So I don't really know what to make of that yet. Um, I think, but I think those are the kind of questions that are going to, going to get addressed. We didn't really get into, into systemic, yes. <laughs> systemic <laughs> aging all that much. I don't know if you want to continue this or if you want to. I want to make like my summary statement, if I may. Yes, please, Irina. Yes. Of course, please do. Then. I'm sure you do. Right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, sorry, right. sorry if I'm interrupting. So I want to make my uh, my summary statement first of all by stating kind of obvious biomedical facts that mice that live only two years have much longer telomeres and much higher telomerase activity everywhere, and they do not die from cancers. They die from the whole milieu of tissue attrition problems that people have, but much faster, much, on much faster scale. So the first thing is that with respect to telomerase or any single gene that could make an organism live longer, it probably will not exist because aging is multigenetic problem, multigenetic disease, I wouldn't call it problem. So mice have 10 times longer telomeres than people, and they have much higher telomerase activity in many more subsets of their cells, yet they die much faster. They only live two years, we live 100 years. And when they die, they do not die from cancers. They die from tissue attrition. They have osteoporosis, brittle bones. They lack, lose muscle, accumulate fat, have cardiac problems, liver problems, adiposity, so thin, thin skin, not, thin less skin. functional immune system, right? Yes, usual stuff, cataracts. Right? Yeah, yeah. Can you imagine <laughs> cataracts in two years? So, um, so telomerase and telomeres did not save them. And then my uh, last metaphor would be comparing humans or organized system with an automobile. So cars have also limited functional lifespan. And when cars die, they do not die because evil mechanic comes and destroys your car. No, mechanic tries to repair it as much as they can. And then in the end, they cannot repair it anymore because attrition is too much. And they just tell you, hey, buddy, this is the end of the road. So, um, so Everything that I know about biology tells me that that's pretty much what is going on with human aging and mammalian aging in general. There is attrition and better ways to repair it has not yet evolved because they were not needed really for the progeny to be successful. But to give you like the positive outcome, perhaps as research scientists, we will then develop such a ways and we will enhance the ability of organized systems to remain organized for a few more decades at the very least. Okay. Okay, Josh, and, and you, what, uh, what is your final consideration, taking into account what uh, you expect to happen in the next years regarding uh, aging science? For example, uh, if this question will be answered, I mean, if systemic uh, aging will be... Uh, shown as a, as a as a fact or if uh cell cell aging will prevail uh do you do you think in the next years uh this can be solved uh yeah let me just briefly answer arena uh, first uh, about maria blasco's experiments there are many papers going back i think 15 years including just giving them a stragalus extract which extends, uh, which expresses telomerase, and all of them tend to show life extension through more telomerase. And of course, this is paradoxical because you would think that mice already have all the telomere that they need. They don't 
run out of uh, telomere the way humans do. Uh, about cancer, I'm really happy to learn something new. I, I thought that mice generally die of cancer, and you guys have experimental experience with a laboratory extensive as, as much as anybody. So this is good information for me. Uh, in, in general, I'm just pleased as punch to be able to be talking to Mike and Arena. I've been citing their work for years and years, exactly in this context of aging is primarily systemic. And uh, this is a message that they've pushed with their experimental results for a long time. And it's really optimistic for the future of anti-aging medicine. If aging is process of cellular deterioration, what a job we've got to go into the body and repair every cell. It's a, a nightmare, and you can't imagine we would make very much progress. But to the extent that aging is a systemic thing, then it's a matter of signaling. It's these signal molecules in the blood that we need to go after. We need to get rid of the... Um, the signal molecules that make us old, which Mike and Irena have done more than anybody to uh, document, and also to add the signal molecules that make you young, which Harold Katcher has documented. And to me, that's the most promising thing in aging research going forward, is to find the signal molecules that tell the body at the cellular level to be young or to be old and to modify the signaling environment. Um, I also want to add that the people who are most famous in this field and have been responsible over the years for making the most progress, they're all closet believers in programmed aging. I have talked to Tuck Finch. I've talked to George Church, Cynthia Kenyon, Dale Bredesen, Rafa DeCabo, uh, some, some of these big names from long, long ago, and they'll confide in me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, of course, I believe that aging is programmed, but I can't say that out loud. I'd lose my grant. And uh, that's why having discussions like this, getting them out in the open is so important. I think that all of the progress that's being made in the field the, the most promising things in life extension comes from people taking a systemic approach and not the approach of um, repair at the molecular level or the cellular level. So the fact that aging is programmed, the fact that it's systemic is enormously positive for the future of anti-aging research. Okay. Uh, thanks, Josh. I don't want to take uh, more of your time. And it's clear from this conversation that science is is a very um, not only very interesting but uh, a serious thing and can't be solved uh, in 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 just one conversation. And I hope this uh, helps the viewers to understand that they have to, you know, help uh, enter you know, the field and, and, and help you because that, that is so much work to do to achieve rejuvenation and save lives. That's is, is the aim of everybody, I, I believe. So I, I would like to thank you very much. Uh, I know that this conversation could continue, but <laughs> this, uh, this, this can be made in another time. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for your... Thanks for thanks for thanks for reading and so much so broadly and writing right. I, I don't read as broad, broadly as you, so it's 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 always a pleasure to 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 read read what you write. And even if I don't agree with it all, I, I still get a chance to reflect and I still get to, to 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 think about. Well, you know, yeah, maybe it is that right, or you know, or why, why do I why do I not think a particular thing, or why do I agree? Right. So very helpful. All right. Thank thank you, Nicholas, for putting, putting this on. Right. So. Mike and Irena, thank you for all the work that you're doing. I think some of the most promising research is coming out of your lab. And thanks to you, Nicholas, for arranging this. Okay, thanks, Mike and Irena. Are, uh, you are always uh, the, one of the most important names in, in this field. So, uh, so thank you, uh, everybody, for, for the debate. And uh, until next time, 
when we can extend this 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 great conversation bye bye <laughs>